I don't know how old I was, but I am pretty sure that I was pretty young. And I remember that I was in church one day and then I had a thought. And my thought went like this. See, I looked up to where the minister was. You know, he stood on his pulpit and, you know, from where I was sitting, he was towering over me and he was wearing his black robe that always made him look so severe, so serious. And he was going on and on preaching in his sonorous voice. I have no idea what he was saying. Uh, I probably generally didn't have any idea what he was saying, which is maybe one of the problems that led to my thought. But I remember distinctly having this thought. I remember thinking, oh, it must be so nice for him being able to know that he is going to heaven. Now, why did I think that? It probably really had nothing to do with what he was saying. As far as I know, he always, always preached a gospel of grace. He certainly never proclaimed that it was only people like him who would get into heaven. No, it wasn't what he said. It was more to do with what I inferred from the actions and the words of others. It was just that I knew. I knew I was living in a world where there were a lot of expectations of me, expectations of how I would behave, that I would be good, expectations of how I would perform in school and in other areas of life. And I was just keenly aware that I did not often live up to those expectations. And when I fell short of those expectations, I lived in fear, in fear of punishment. Not necessarily physical punishment, of course, but but you know what? People had ways of letting me know when they were displeased with me. And when that was the life that I was living, that's the way I saw the world. It wasn't a big step to take all of those assumptions about how my world worked and map them onto God. And so, yes, I assumed that God was busy judging me and inclined to punish me more than anything else. I was pretty sure that I didn't quite measure up to what God wanted of me, and so I displeased God. Now, I don't say any of this in order to imply that my parents or others around me did me wrong. They were, as, as far as I know, totally concerned with me. They wanted me to do well in life, right? They wanted me not to be afraid of hard work. They wanted me to learn to do the right thing, to be a good person. But these expectations they put upon me, these bound rules and boundaries that they set for me, they were all about trying to make sure that I was a safe, happy, well-rounded individual. So it's really not their fault if I experienced that as judgment of me, and it's not their fault if it made me feel bad about myself. It was not their intention. But to a certain extent, it may have been inevitable. Because it seems that there is this tendency in humanity, in the human brain, when we are presented with reasonable boundaries and helpful rules and regulations that are meant to guide us to live well, we quickly jump to the conclusion that we are being judged and found wanting and being threatened with punishment. And sometimes, yes, this conclusion is driven by the people themselves who are trying to guide us because they're afraid. They're afraid that, that they might not succeed, and so sometimes they go overboard with, with threats or criticism, and we end up jumping to our conclusion. But sometimes, honestly, this comes from ourselves and our lack of self-confidence and this fear that we will not measure up. In both cases, the root problem is actually fear. 
And you know what? The history of God's relationship with the people of Israel worked just like that. God chose the people of Israel to be God's chosen vessel to bring good into the world. God wanted these people to do well, to live well, to build each other up and to remain faithful. And so we are told in the scriptures that God gave them a Torah to live by. Now that word, Torah, is commonly translated to English as law. But the Hebrew word Torah actually means something closer to guidance or teaching. The point of it was not just that people should follow certain regulations and abide by certain limitations. The point of it was that people should live well and in communion with one another. The point of the Torah was never mere obedience. It was always supposed to be about helping people to live their very best lives. But like I say, what is given as guidance and teaching with the best of intentions is often received by us as obligation, restriction, judgment. And if that happens to children growing up as Christians who hear the gospel of grace, like happened to me when I was a child. Well, you can be sure that it also happened with the ancient people of Israel. This was not a flaw in the Jewish faith itself. In ancient times and still today, Jews who take the Torah seriously can experience living by the Torah as a joyful thing as something that helps them to hold on to their identity, that makes them who they are made to be as best as they were created to be. Experience, experiencing such guidance as a burden is not merely a Jewish problem, it is a human problem. And it's in that sense we need to understand the passage we read this morning from the book of the prophet Jeremiah. Jeremiah is speaking for God when he says this. This is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my Torah within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Now, the traditional Christian interpretation of that passage is that Jeremiah in it is looking forward looking forward to the coming of Jesus and saying that Jesus will set us free from living under the obligation of the law. And it's not as if that interpretation is entirely wrong. I mean, yes, there is a real sense in which Jesus has brought about the fulfillment of this passage. But we also need to realize that it's true that Jeremiah understood that the people didn't need to wait for the Messiah to come for them to be able to live out this promise. Because it had always been the desire of God that the people live the Torah from their hearts and not simply by following written rules. If anyone opened up their heart to God, God would be willing to give them the kind of Torah that could be written on their hearts instead of being chiseled on tablets of stone. Yes, yes, Jesus has come to set us free from living under the tyranny of rules and regulations, but you know what? That was always the intention of God giving the Torah. So then, what can we say that Jesus added to make you know, living the Torah from your heart more possible. Well, in our reading this morning from the Gospel of John, Jesus says this, Now is the judgment of this world. So Jesus, what Jesus says here is important because it tells us a lot about why Jesus came. And he says that he, his coming is connected to judgment, but not the judgment we usually assume that it's about. This is not about the judgment of individuals. I mean, yes, 
individuals are responsible for their own actions, but the bigger problem is and always has been the system by which this world operates. And that's the system I struggled with when I was younger. The world system that told me that I was not good enough. That, that system that often arbitrarily condemns people to live lives dominated by guilt and shame. That is the system that continually fails to help us to be the best people that we can be. And here Jesus declares, now the ruler of this world will be driven out. The world system with all of its flaws is being dismantled. And then Jesus goes on to explain how his coming has made this possible. And I when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. That is what the, the crucifixion of Jesus is about. It is nothing but the most potent demonstration of God's love ever seen in the history of the world. That is, that is what it has, is at its heart. But you see, it is a demonstration of love that has always been there. If you read the Old Testament with understanding, you realize that that deep abiding love has been behind God's every action right from the very beginning. For it was out of love, out of love that God created us in the first place. If had God wanted obedient drones, we could have been programmed to follow every commandment, but no, God valued love for us more than compliance from us. And so we were created as free beings. The Old Testament covenant, that basis of the relationship of the people of Israel with their God was founded upon an idea on something that they called chesed, and chesed is often translated as the steadfast, loving kindness of God. It was out of love that God, out of that love, that God gave the Torah. Again, not to control people, but to guide them, to guide them in the, into the best way of living. Love was the underlying premise of every action of God throughout the Bible. God's perspective has always been love, but we, we are the ones who mess all of that up and turn it rather into a story that is concerned only with judgment and obedience, a story that is the very opposite of love. And so love and grace were always the key to the story. The problem is just that we have a hard time receiving that story. Just like when I was a kid and decided that I needed to buy my way into God's good graces by my good works, so do we also reason. So, what then does Jesus do to change all of that? Well, Jesus is merely the purest, most unrefined image of the love of God that we have ever seen. This image... Uh, uh, is made most perfect in Jesus loving the people enough to be willing to be crucified for them. That's what Jesus means when he says, and I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. The image of Jesus upon the cross is an image so clear, so compelling of love, that it becomes this powerful magnet drawing people towards God. And they come not out of a sense of obligation or fear or judgment, but rather as a response to such pure love. That is how Jesus, lifted up from the cross, becomes the fulfillment of everything that Jeremiah was looking forward to even as Jesus continues to be part of the same story of God's steadfast loving kindness that has always been there. Ah, uh, but of course, 
Jesus on the cross is a story almost 2,000 years old. 2,000 years later, there are still many who are living under the tyranny of the law, under the tyranny of fear, of not measuring up, of not being worthy of love and acceptance. As that was true of me as a young boy growing up in the church, it is also true of many Christians. And that is the cause of the problem of our failure to truly understand the meaning of Jesus upon the cross. The, promise, the problem is not that image. It's not that the image wasn't clear. Nothing could have been clearer. The problem is found in our own hearts. And so long as we carry around in our own hearts this idea that we are not good enough, that we do not measure up, the true message of love will not penetrate. And Jeremiah is right. We do need a new heart. We need a Torah inscribed upon our hearts. So here is our spiritual exercise for today. You have brought, I hope, a heart with you. I asked you to make one. This has got to be one of the easiest crafts we've done during this season of Lent. And even if you haven't brought one, I actually would encourage you to make a heart. Easy to do. Piece of paper, a pair of scissors. Make one, and I want you to do as I instruct you. If you can't do it right now, do it after we're done. But here's what I want you to do. I want you to take your heart, and I want you to take a pen or pencil, and I want you to write the Torah on your heart. Yeah. Write the Torah on our heart. How do we do that? What do we do? Do we write some particular command or rule? Maybe the golden rule of doing to others as they have done to us? Is that it? Do we just need a perfect rule and then we'll be able to hold the Torah on our heart? No. No, here's what I want you to do. I want you to write this on your heart. Are you ready? Write this. I am loved, accepted, and approved by God, just as I am. That is it. I am loved, accepted, and approved by God, just as I am. That's the message. That is the message that God sought to put on our hearts from the cross. And if you accept this truth, the truth of this statement, it is the first step towards having a Torah in your life that you can follow in your heart, with all your heart because you are spurred by joy and love and not merely by obligation. Heavenly Father, write your Torah on our hearts with your steadfast love. Amen.